and craft. Fiber Stories highlights the full spectrum of fiber crafts, showcasing more than 45 New England and national artists with a breadth of experience and styles in basketry, weaving, felting, knitting, and quilting. Visitors will be able to purchase, to purchase a wide range of home goods, wearables, jewelry, accessories, decorative art, and wall hangings in a variety of price points and styles. Fiber Stories also features weekly events with artists sharing stories that offer an in-depth look at their work, their practices, and their worldviews. Tickets to these events are available on our website under events, and they are always free to attend. Lastly, I want to highlight and thank our sponsors and program partners for their generous support of Craft Boston, the Fiber Stories Marketplace, and our educational programs. We could not have accomplished our work without these nonprofits and businesses, and I want to take a moment to showcase and thank them here. Two final housekeeping items. Your microphones are muted, and we ask that you please keep them muted until the end of the feature presentation. There are many people in this Zoom meeting, and keeping microphones muted will help reduce noise distractions like ringing phones or dog barking in the background. Thank you so much for your help with this. We do have a chat room available for everyone who would like to ask questions during the presentation, and we encourage you to make use of this feature. The chat function can be found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will answer as many of your questions as we can right after the feature presentation. And with that said, I am happy to introduce our speakers for this afternoon. Joe Steely is an artist, curator, professor emerita of the University of Missouri. During her career, she was the head of the fiber program and founding director for the visual, for the School of Visual Studies. And she is a trustee of the Society of Arts and Crafts. Kristen Schwein, Associate Professor of American Art in the School of Visual Studies at the University of Missouri. She holds joint PhDs in art history and humanities from Stanford University. And Carol Eckert is a studio artist who has worked within the basketry field for over 30 years. She employs a simple basketry technique, coiling, to construct a myriad of forms, including staffs, books, processionals, and wall pieces, all focused on the complex interactions between humans and the natural world. Are we ready? Yes, we are. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Brigida. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you, and we want to thank you for joining us to review Rooted, Revived, Reinvented Basketry in America and revisit the wonderful baskets that were part of this show. Being makers and lovers of baskets ourselves, we are thrilled to share our passion and what we have learned about the history of basketry in the United States since the rise of the Industrial Revolution in the late 1800s to the dawn of the contemporary basketry movement in the 1960s and its emergence into the mainstream of contemporary art today. 
Christian Schwein is going to be talking about the early precedents in uh, basketry. So Kristen, take it away, please. Thank you, Joe. It's a, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you this afternoon. I am uh, going to provide a brief overview of the historical landscape of contemporary basketry, or to put it another way, the rooted of rooted, revised, reinvented. For centuries, baskets made with local materials and trade goods and with techniques handed down from generation to generation served economic, ritual, and utilitarian functions. However, the expansion of the Industrial Revolution in the second half of the 19th century fundamental, fundamentally altered the production, distribution, and use of baskets. The processes of modernization facilitated the manufacture of inexpensive and standardized baskets once made by hand. In 1911, photographer Lewis Hine visited a factory in Evansville, Indiana to expose the abuse of child labor. Standing amid an assortment of materials situated in barrels, a young woman performs her specialized role in the progressive assembly of melon baskets. Slide. Thank you. While modern industry and global trade may have diminished the need to make baskets, there was a broad cultural desire to study, produce, consume, and display them. The middle to upper class vogue for Native American artifacts the growth of the arts and crafts movement and craft-based economic development projects, and the expansion of the manual training and occupational therapy movements all shared at least three assumptions about the value of handmade objects. Objects preserve tradition and ethnic identity. Objects were part and parcel of modern consumer culture and objects help cultivate aesthetic judgment, a cornerstone of civilized behavior. Baskets then were far more than utilitarian objects. They were ethnographic artifacts, saleable goods, economic opportunities, souvenirs, collector's items, household decorations, education and therapeutic tools, and works of art, often at the same time. Slide, please. At the turn of the century, many middle to upper class European Americans looked to what they looked to cultures they deemed primitive to counteract what they perceived as the banality, over civilization, and weightlessness of modern life. The Indian basket became a key symbol of this movement. In 1904, Smithsonian curator Otis Mason coined the term canastromania from the Latin word canistra, meaning basket, to describe the basket fever that gripped the nation. Indeed, Indian baskets were omnipresent. This overcrowded slide of mass media articles, advertisements, and covers illustrates the manifold ways that indigenous baskets permeated American life as domestic arts, as souvenirs, as you toured the Southwest, as collector's items for the creation of what were known as Indian corners. And they, they're the baskets of availability virtually anywhere, including um, large urban department stores like Wanamaker's in New York. Slide, please. Many Native Americans embraced these new markets, reviving traditions that had become dormant with mass production and using them as sources of economic development and individual expression. Although Native Americans and Europeans had a long history of intercultural exchange, going back at least three centuries, promoters of Native crafts marketed them as timeless artifacts of authentic cultural traditions, uncontaminated by commercial life. In 1895, for example, 
Abe and Amy Cohn purchased baskets from Louisa Kaiser, a Washoe basket weaver, and soon became her sole distributors. The Cones meticulously catalog, marketed, and sold Kaiser's baskets, and in return covered her and her husband's expenses. They were praised for controlling Kaiser's entire artistic output and sequestering her from civilization, thereby preserving, according to critics, the Washoe art unmixed with the influence of the commercial order. Kaiser, however, was a very savvy, modern woman, keenly aware of her audience and her own talents. She transformed deji cup baskets, a rather simple utilitarian basket often used in ceremonies, into a fine art object sold to collectors and museums. She altered its shape and produced large sculptural forms with a flat base and small opening. In addition, she invented some designs and found inspiration for others in Pomo and Miwok weaving. Far from authentic objects of a pre-modern past, Kaiser's baskets were modern creations. Slide. The American arts and crafts movement also developed in response, as many of you know, to the Industrial Revolution. Madeline Yale Wynne, a leader of the Deerfield, Massachusetts arts and crafts movement, lamented the status of commercial baskets. In place of the super superfluous decorations that adorn them, she echoed the movement's agenda by seeking what she called a basket of fine, honest intent and beautiful make. Wynne's despair over commercial baskets did not include a renunciation of the economic system that produced them, but rather a reconciliation of handwork and consumption. Our hands, she wrote, are daily growing in skill, enthusiasm reigns, and we joy in the doing. Behold, we have made baskets, yes, and sold them. For every basket, there has been a buyer. Slide, please. One of the underlying assumptions of the arts and crafts movement that the cultivation of taste was pivotal to the development of character contributed to the introduction of basketry into art and manual training programs in the public schools. Concerned with the influx of immigrants and the growing threat of urban and working class unrest, tastemakers believed that the appreciation and production of art would promote social stability, as well as middle-class values and standards of deportment. William S. Martin's book, Inexpensive Basketry, proposed a course of study for elementary schools predicated on the production of coil baskets. Some of them, as you can see from the size, very large. He argued that it served three essential functions. It rooted students in their local communities, it cultivated their artistic sense and it prepared them for the workforce. Slide. The relationship between traditional craft and modern industry also influenced the schools charged with assimilating Native and African Americans into modern American life. The Penn Normal Industrial and Educational School in St. Helena Island in South Carolina proudly announced in 1905 the demand that the demand for the island baskets of Rush and Palmetto led them to hire a native teacher to provide instruction for 33 students. Beginning, and while they claimed that uh, the reason for for this hire was to promote traditional basketry. Their goal was also economic. Beginning that same year, the school started selling baskets through mail order and retail outlets. And by 1913, through arts and crafts stores in Charleston, Philadelphia, and Boston. The role of craft and uplift ideology was not limited to indigenous and black Americans. It also embraced the rural poor. Allen Stand, Allen Stand Cottage Industries was an outgrowth of mission work by the Presbyterian Church in North Carolina. 
When a local woman gave the art educated school teacher, Frances Goodrich, a pre Civil War coverlet as a gift, Goodrich saw a native art form that had all but disappeared with the arrival of the textile mills. She also saw an opportunity an opportunity to preserve a traditional craft from extinction, to relieve economic hardship, and to give women the pleasure of producing beautiful things. She established to a mail order market for traditional crafts. And here I'm showing you a promotional photograph on the left, on the right slide, please. Finally, the ubiquity of basketry in modern life and the pedagogical utility of handicraft influenced the emerging profession of occupational therapy. In 1915, physician Herbert Hall proposed a science of work that studied the effect of productive work on each patient for both its therapeutic and economic value. Through a return to traditional crafts such as basket weaving and pottery making, early occupational therapists sought to rescue a restorative work ethic, both from the degrading practice of factory work and from the quiet despotism of bed rest. Some of the most enduring images of the era were photographs of recuperating soldiers weaving baskets in military hospitals. Slide, please. The Industrial Revolution and the cultural movements that responded to it created new markets and audiences for traditional baskets. As you have heard repeated kind of through all these examples, this occurred when European American cultural entrepreneurs, most often women, discovered a basketry tradition and introduced it to a mass audience. And here I'm showing you American art collector and dealer Grace Nicholson on a hunt for baskets that would be sold in her shop, um, which I show you here circa 1906. Basket makers in turn altered their production to meet the demand of the marketplace and use the opportunity for economic advancement and aesthetic expression. The relationship was by no means equal. The works of so-called primitive cultures were appropriated into Western models of commodity production altering their conventional uses. Baskets were absorbed too into the Western European system of art, particularly its burgeoning emphasis on formal criteria and attention to the individual aesthetic object. Finally, historical baskets from all regions and traditions were absorbed into a lineage of modern art that artists, artists critics, and curators considered truly American. And now we're gonna move on to the movement, the more formal introduction of baskets into the art world with Joe Steely. Thank you, Kristen. So um, I'm going to talk about what became known as new basketry. And this followed World War II and the beginning of the studio craft movement. It was also a time when a, a lot of the veterans from World War II went back to school and decided to go into art programs. And it also became a moment when traditional craft programs moved into fine arts programs and initiated a very lively conversation between the makers of historically craft objects and painters and sculptors. It was also a moment when we moved from uh, the, the modernist movement into the abstract expressionist movement when materials became a means of expression and there was a lot of exploration of um, different kinds of materials in, to make art. Ed Rosbach, whose pieces on the left, was one of the main movers and shakers of the new basketry in the 1960s. He was a faculty member at the University of California, Berkeley, where he integrated basket techniques into his art and design curriculum and introduced it as part of contemporary art. 
His study of global weaving and textual traditions, both historical and contemporary, reflected his philosophy that baskets were as sculptural and architectural as the cast bronzes that adorn art museums and the skyscrapers that populate our metropolitan cityscape. He translated traditional harvesting methods to modern life and coined the phrase urban foraging. He found readily available materials like plants and sticks, as well as contemporary surplus, such as foils, plastic bags, and newspapers for his work. He also engaged his fine art trends, appropriating popular culture iconography, like his East Coast contemporary, Andy Warhol. By combining traditional basketry techniques and modern arts critique of the status quo, this basket elevates the famous Disney character Mickey Mouse to the realm of fine art and critiques the low status given to craft media during this era. Through his generous spirit, he inspired students and colleagues alike, such as Ginge Lockie, who is on the right. Next slide, please as well as his colleagues, Joanne Siegel Branford and Pat Hickman, who was a student who also became a collaborator with Lillian Elliott. These artists, among many others, formulated a hotbed of innovation in California, which quickly spread across the country. Next slide, please. A second thread of this contemporary basketry movement is what is, we call living traditions. Basketry, basket makers from the Appalachians to the Sierra Nevadas continued a rich cultural history of their craft while investigating their own basket techniques and, and styles. Some artists came from multi-generational families of basket makers, while others participate in and contribute to these traditions through experimentation, apprenticeships, and workshops. While these baskets e echo their historical antecedents and remain functional, they have become aestheticized objects in private and public collections. Our first example is Jose Formoso Reyes, who was an immigrant from the Philippines, who grew up making rattan furniture with, from his, which he learned from his father, he was educated at, to teach art, but he could not find a position in the United States. So he apprenticed himself with a traditional Nantucket light ship basket maker. He then went on to create these covered handbags to capitalize on contemporary fashion trends and post-war consumerism. He fashioned a dome lid with a center plaque as a stage for luxury add-ons and marketed it as a friendship basket to symbolize the owner's relationship to the island. And you see here a commissioned purse. Young women would receive a purse from, from Jose to commemorate their graduation from Nantucket High School every year, while tourists purchase them for souvenirs. Next slide, please. And here you see women at, in gatherings, all who are wearing their Nantucket friendship purse. And on the right, you see a price list that um, you could custom order depending on how much you wanted to spend. One of the most delightful stories that we learned in our research was that uh, reportedly an American in Paris noticed another woman uh, who had the same accessory. And she raised her purse to ask, Nantucket? And the other replied, we, oui, Nantucket. And the two formed a lifelong friendship. Next slide, please. Kentucky-based Leona Waddell learned to weave at the age of nine from her mother. She supported the family by selling and trading baskets during the Great Depression. The form and construction of this egg basket are traditional while the intricately plated rim and handle draw attention to Wydell's innovative design and aesthetic sensibility. 
In 2016, she was named a National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellow for maintaining the traditional form of the region's baskets and putting her own personalized evolving imprint on each one. Her, today, her work is found in the Smithsonian as well as many private collections. On the right is another basket maker, Catherine Lewis, who also represents living traditions. Uh, Catherine has a lifelong commitment to willow basketry. And this has led her to travel throughout Europe to study with traditional basket makers and to grow and harvest over 60 varieties of willow at Dunbar, Dunbar Gardens in Washington State. Drawing on her historical and material research, she twists willow branches into a coiled rope to create an extremely strong and functional basket. The exterior suggests windblown branches showcasing the subtle color of the willow. Again, Catherine's work is found in the Smithsonian as well as many private collections, and you can purchase willow from her for your own baskets. Next slide, please. The energy and enthusiasm generated by the new basketry fueled many artists to explore baskets as a sculptural vessel. Artists experimented with old and new production methods and embraced a range of materials from prunings to metals, from thread to filament, from paper to photographs. Their investigations also motivated by modernism's emphasis on the medium as the primary carrier of meaning produced a visual language that I'm sorry, excuse me, enabled artists to inter interrogate American history and culture and create aestheticized objects intended for extended contemplation. Pat Courtney Gold and the next few artists merge living traditions and basket as a means of contemporary expression through traditional vessel forms. Pat received a BA in mathematics and for many years she taught math as well as worked as a mathematician computer specialist. However, she had a midlife crisis and decided that she wanted to do something to help celebrate her Wasco heritage. She went to um, the museum where some of these bas historical baskets were, were located and housed because they no longer had a basket making tradition. And she very carefully transcribed the designs that she saw on these historical baskets to graph paper and taught herself how to weave these baskets. In this particular piece, she has expanded those traditions into a very contemporary form. This basket features a couple of two guises. On one side, they appear Indian according to the traditional iconography of native life. On the other, they flaunt the urban style they acquired after leaving the reservation. Man is wearing a blue suit and tie as well as a fedora. And the woman is a professional woman wearing a tight dress, heels, lipstick, and jewelry. The pairs are linked by a design that juxtaposes an historic Californian condor with a modern airplane reinforcing Gold's examination of the many elements, both traditional and contemporary, native and non-native, that fashion Indian identity. Next slide, please. Eva Wolf on the left, Eva Queen Wolf, is a Western band Cherokee weaver. She learned weaving techniques from her mother and her aunt, Lottie Queen Stamper, who taught basket making at the Cherokee Indian School from 1937 to 1966. She focused on double weave baskets with river cane so that it might be retained for future generations. Sean Goshorn on the right is part of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation. She did not learn to make baskets as a child, but was a trained artist. She formed this traditional double weave basket out of watercolor paper splints printed on two sides. One of the 
one with the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which President Andrew Jackson used to force the Cherokee out of their ancestral homeland six years later, and the other with a double exposed, hand-tinted black and white photograph of a contemporary Cherokee woman seated in the mountains of North Carolina. Goshorn's use of a double exposure suggests that the past and the present are intimately and inextricably, inextricably connected and that the historical trauma experienced by Native peoples continues to affect the present. Next basket, please. Uh, next slide, please, not and the next basket. Um, artists were also pushing well beyond traditional vessel forms. Current artists often br bridge the gap between the craft origins of basket making and the medium's new place within sculpture, textile, and installation art. By incorporating traditional and non traditional techniques and materials, and by exploring scale and dynamic form, these artists address a wide variety of ideas and issues, including the visualization of scientific data, cultural appropriation, and environmental politics. In addition, they address the nature of art itself, how form and materials can be the subject of art, as well as its meaning, and how art navigates between and among utility, commodity, and the aestheticized object in the fine art world. Their work confirms basketry status as a significant force for the contemporary art. Lisa Telford is a Haida artist who has done this with her cedar, cedar bark dress. She has extended the hiatus baskets into wearables and rather than weaving hats and ceremonial regalia, she transformed cedar bark into wearable staples of the contemporary womanhood in the hat, in the dress and the shoes. Next slide, please. Kate Anderson in, in this knotted teapot pot appropriates Roy Lichtenstein's Girl with Hair Ribbon from 1965 and the comic book series Secret Hearts, the inspiration behind the pop art painting. The knotting domesticates Lichtenstein's famous painting, Ben Day Dots, replicating mechanical printing processes by juxtaposing a distraught and ang anxious young woman with a comic book text that dramatized stories of unrequited love. Anderson uses mid-century iconography to challenge the ideal of white urban domesticity. Next slide, please. Many artists pursue basketry as sculpture exploring a variety of forms, materials, techniques, and conceptual ideas. There are so many I would love to show you, but time won't allow. Here are a few examples from the exhibition. In the upper left is Dorothy McGinnis, who uh, does paper weaving in, in very wonderful um, abstract forms. Below hers is Leon Niehaus from Arkansas, who harvests all of his own materials and has become quite well known uh, for both his functional as well as his sculptural vessels. Christine Joy in the middle from Montana, who weaves sculptural vessels with willow that she harvests. On the bottom is Leah Danberg from California, who knots uh, beautiful sculptural work. In the upper right is Jerry Bleen, who often works with staples and paper to create this ventricle-like object. And then Aaron Kramer, who has combined both uh, traditional we weaving materials as well as the tines from uh, street cleaning machines that he's gathered um, to create this form. Next slide, please. I'm going to quickly go through the next two images uh, because I know that we have um, a, a time constraint. Amy Masters is one of the emerging artists that was part of this show. And Amy is doing these interactive sculptures that um, are animated most, most wonderfully when they are worn on the body. And so what you're seeing here on the right is part of the project that she did called Being Gatlinburg Special. It's an old time photo booth and her response to living in the tourist town of Gatlinburg. 
Tennessee. All objects in the scene she collected from the town itself. And many community members participated in this project, such as this man that you see wearing one of her woven uh, basket garments. And she reminds us that it's very wonderful to continue to have curiosity and playfulness as adults. Next slide, please. So I'm going to finish with the work by Aaron Fisher, who was also an emerging artist um, at the time that we were putting the show together. He is one of a great number of artists today who are navigating between um, doing one of a kind gallery work and uh, running a small manufacturing company in order to find his way in the craft world. In this piece on the left, Work is composed of a shaker style pegboard holding a series of handcrafted implements made from historical and contemporary materials. At first, it appears to be an historic installation, perhaps celebrating the shaker ethos of putting your hands to work and your hearts to God. However, the actual utility of the tools remain a mystery. His, he, Fisher questions the very conception of handcraft by calling attention to the romanticism that surrounds it. Even the shakers employed industrial methods like the assembly line and catalog marketing to meet the needs of consumers. And on the right, you see um, the website for his business. He is doing mostly utilitarian objects in uh, clay and wood. Um, that are sold through places like anthropology and many, um, and also to many restaurants. And as Mary Butcher quoted in the late 20th century, um, basketry was one of the most dynamic art movements in the US. And I think you can see why from the few examples that I've shown. And next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce Carol Eckert, who was also in this exhibition. And as you, as everyone knows, Carol is well known for her coiled narrative sculptures. And this particular one, according to Isidore, was in the show. And Carol also wrote a wonderful chapter for the catalog. And she's going to talk about um, some of uh, the work that she did in that chapter. Next slide. Carol, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Well, Janine Felino and I each wrote chapters for the exhibition catalog. And Joe and Kristen asked us to think more broadly about the field of basketry and to consider the future of the field. So our approaches were slightly different, but there were a number of overlaps in our thinking. Next. We each included installations. I featured John McQueen's uh, gallery filling exhibition at the Racine Art Museum. And Janine included uh, the bamboo installation by Doug and Mike Stern on the roof of the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, many of you know John, who's been a leader in the American basketry field for many years. He began making vessels and then evolved into making a number of sculptural pieces and then eventually expanded into installation work. The Starns came at it from a slightly different perspective as interdisciplinary artists, and they were influenced by the traditional bamboo scaffolding. Next. I included um, artists working within the land art movement. Uh, Chris Drury is uh, an artist from the UK. And a number of artists working uh, within land art uh, work at festivals. They participate at festivals throughout Europe, often working with materials they gather on site and creating structures that are very closely related to the earliest use of basketry techniques by human beings. Janine talked about architecture and she included this uh, London building by Norman Foster, which is very related to basketry, both in form and texture. Next. We also featured 
sculptors who wouldn't necessarily identify as basket makers. So he Pick is a Cambodian American artist. He moved to Cambodia after graduating from the Chicago Art Institute. And there he works in a rural studio using locally harvested bamboo with traditional and experimental joining techniques. And Martin Purrier has referenced basketry forms throughout his career, um, influenced by some of the processes he saw uh, working as a Peace Corps volunteer in Sierra Leone very early in his career. Next. And I um, included Fiona Hall. She's a well uh, established Australian sculptor who often deals with social and political issues. She worked collaboratively with the Jean P. Desert Weavers for Australia's 2015 um, pavilion exhibition at the Venice Biennale. The, the Jean P. Desert Weavers are a cooperative of women who work in very remote regions of Central and Western Australia with locally gathered uh, jampi grass. And the creatures that they made for this installation are animals that have disappeared from their lands, many of them becoming extinct. So as, as I was writing my catalog essay and thinking about the future of basketry, I could see certain things developing like artists working at increased scale, um, artists expanding into installation work, and individual artists working across disciplines. But even though exhibition artists like Sean Goshern and Natalie Maybach were dealing with social justice issues and climate issues, I didn't really appreciate how strong that movement would become. Um, since the catalog was published in 2017, the basketry field has continued to flourish and expand with many artists incorporating basketry concepts and basketry processes into work that deals with social and political issues. Next. This is Diedrich Brackens. He's an LA-based artist who's become very well known for his tapestry work. And just recently, he's become begun to incorporate basketry into his practice. These images are from his current exhibition at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art. It includes his tapestry work, his basketry forms, and also photographs of him interacting with the basketry pieces in the environment. Next, Jose Santiago Perez uh, works in Chicago and he teaches at the Art Institute there. He was trained as a performance artist and frequently incorporates performance into his exhibitions. He works with plastics and including repurposed emergency blankets and his color palette is influenced by a Salvadorian American heritage. Next. Sarah Zabata is another artist who often works with tapestry. She frequently combines tapestry and basketry techniques in her sculptures and installation work. Uh, she's based in Brooklyn. And she draws upon her Peruvian heritage with references to, to, to traditional rope baskets and ancient textiles. Dee Clements on the right uh, founded Studio Heron in Detroit. Uh, she's another person who initially was focused almost exclusively on tapestry at the studio um, and have just recently expanded into basketry. She works with interior designers, galleries, and architects, producing one-of-a-kind special collections and addition pieces. 
And as an entrepreneur, she incorporates her concern for the environment into her studio by focusing on sustainability and small scale local production. Next. Sarita Westrup on the left uh, lives and works in the uh, Mexico, Mexico, Texas border region. And many of her pieces are focused on the plight of migrants for uh, crossing brutal terrain. And she's often using references to water containers, water bottles in her work. She also works collaboratively with Annalise Menjares as Terra Ferme. Um, and this piece on the right is one of their sculptures on view at the Nasher Sculpture Center. Next. Merrick Johnson works in Sitka, Alaska. And she works across a variety of media, including performance, video, and painting. And in her basketry sculpture, she works with traditional techniques and materials like black ash. Um, and she's very focused on ecological and social issues, including things like health care and pollution. Next. And my last slide today is Hugh Hayden. He's based in New York. It's another artist who grew up along the Texas-Mexico border, and a lot of his work deals with borders, uh, both borders between countries, borders between communities. He's interested in organic materials and is primarily known for his wood sculptures, but he's just recently begun to incorporate uh, basketry techniques in his work. Um, and he's dealing, he deals with a lot of issues, including masculinity, religion, and social justice. And these two pieces are included in his current exhibition at Lausanne Gallery in New York. So I'm really excited about the future of basketry and fascinated that it's become such a powerful vehicle for dealing with important contemporary issues. Next slide, please. Thanks so much, Carol. I'm super excited about the future of basketry as well, as I know many of you in the audience are today. Um, we are sh shared a very small bird's eye view of some of the research we did and some of the objects that were part of this exhibition. If you would like to know more, our, our book is available through Schiffer Publications. Um, and I know that they would be happy to send you a copy if you wanted one. Um, next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce Lois Russell, who was also part of our exhibition. Um, Lois is also a member of the Society of Arts and Crafts, is our former president and uh, a, a trusted trustee. Um, and Lois is going to help us field all of the questions that you may have. So. Uh, take it away, Lois. Oh, Lois, I think you might be on mute here. I am. So I'll have to say again how wonderful these three people are and how interesting they always are. And I don't think that's just because I am what I've now learned, thanks to Kristen, is a Canestromaniac? Is that the word, Kristen? <laughs> how, how do you spell that? Um, is it C-A-N-I-S-T-R-A-M-A-N-I-A-C? I love it. Uh, <laughs> are there any other canestromaniacs in the, in the crowd? <laughs> I see some hands going up there. Um, it, and it is definitely true that um, once you get started and interested in basketry, it grabs hold of you, whether you are a maker or a collector. Um, basketry is so, so rich in traditions and design and colors and forms. 
Um, I'm going to give people a few minutes to come up with some really good, hard, I won't say hard, <laughs> provocative questions um, for the three of you. I have, I'm going to take advantage of my position here to ask a couple of my own. And the question I want to ask, and I suppose this is mostly directed at Carol, um, because in her blog, she really keeps track of what's going on internationally, um, not just in the States. And yet the work that you did for this exhibition focused on how dynamic basketry has been in the United States for centuries. So I'm interested, Carol, in where you see what's going on in the United States in that, that bigger picture. Um, is there anything that is unique or uh, particularly interesting about American basketry right now? Well, I mean, I, I can't really be a total expert on what's happening in some of these other places. Most of what I know I have learned from going down rabbit holes on the internet. But um, I think that thing that I talked about today, the emphasis on social issues, I think that tends to be very American. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I do see some things happening in other places that aren't happening here. The land art movement, I'm very intrigued by some of the things that are happening there. And that is not as strong in the United States. I mean, there are people like Patrick Dougherty that are out there building, you know, commissioned constructions, but the idea of working out in the forest in cooperative groups um, in these big festivals where people come from a number of different countries, I find very intriguing. And I know some American artists like Jin Schlocky did go to participate in one of those festivals in Italy, but I'd really love it if, if we could get something started like that here. Could, for those people who don't know Patrick Doherty's work, could you just describe it briefly? I, um, I think Lynn has been involved in one of his projects too. Yeah, I've never been involved building them. I've just seen them at various locations. He's often commissioned by places like botanical gardens and universities and art museums to come and build gigantic willow structures that he constructs with the help of community volunteers. Yes. Lynn, could you want to talk about being involved in one of his projects? I, unmute yourself, please. Okay. Um, I was involved with a project that he did at the Peabody Essex, and he used all materials that were gathered on the North Shore. So it was a whole mix of materials, and it was built by him and all volunteers. And um, he, while he came up with the design, um, it was, it took three weeks, 21 days to build this amazing structure. And he specifically wanted it out towards the street because he wanted people to be involved. He wanted to hear their reactions and people were fascinated with it. They loved working on it, but they also loved seeing it happen and wanting to know more about it. And I was thrilled as a basketry person um, to see that much interest in basketry. There's, all, there's also a book about his work and there's a video about his work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, that you can find uh, pretty readily. Yep. I think it's also interesting that they tend to be ephemeral. They don't last forever and there's so much community involvement and work to build them, but they do collapse over time. That's his purpose. And it's it, he he sets it up that way and he says they're going to last two years. You might get a little more out of it. And that's the way he wants it. Yeah, I'm going to say that I think something quite phenomenal is happening because I, I must know at least half of the people. Uh, participating in this. And I know that you are, those I know are not 
shy or, uh, and we are getting no questions. So um, I'll just keep asking a couple more questions, but I really encourage you uh, to either put your hand up, you can put your hand up in the participant function. Um, if you go to participants, you'll see your name. And then at the bottom of that, there's a little blue hand with a raised hand thing. And I, I can't see everyone on one screen. So um, we'll go from that. Molly, Molly has a question. I do. I'm, I'm happy to read it out. So I'm, I'm curious, if this is a question for Carol, I'm curious if you know of any reason why the land art movement hasn't taken off in the U.S. in the same way that it has in other parts of the world. I don't. I don't have the slightest idea. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think I bet you it's just that we need to create an event that basket makers and people who are interested in, in land art want just announce it and come do it. And I bet that that would be the beginning. Well, the, the other thing I would like um, both Joe and Kristen to talk about because this was the other part of this project that was so rewarding. And this exhibition was spectacular. The book is wonderful. But it would not have happened if Joe and Kristen had not involved their students at the University of Missouri. <laughs> and if you could talk just briefly about um, what they did. And I have heard you say before that it really changed the lives of some of the students that were in it. Um, I think that would be really interesting. Do you want to start that, Kristen? Um, yeah, I actually blame them for how large and all encompassing <laughs> this became. Because um, when Joe originally approached me about participating, we thought this will be a great, you know, great opportunity to involve students. And we had for the we did taught three classes with this exhibition as its focus, and each class focused on a different part of the exhibition. And the first group was composed of artists with a lot of background in basketry techniques, artists with none, art historians, archeologists, I mean, kind of all over the place. And th they sort of acted as, okay, this is the audience, right? What would we want to see? And in doing so, they really sparked kind of, first of all, a much bigger organization that I think was much more um, friendly to people who have not been inducted into basketry's history. But they also were the ones who said, you need an interactive map, you need touch panels, you need, you need, right? And they kept bringing this back where they said, well, how are you gonna reach those people who can't get to the exhibition? Maybe you could do, and when you have 18 people with different skill sets, you know, coming together with that kind of interest, it becomes just sort of a spark plug. And, you know, classes after that also, um, you know, contributed it in, in different ways. Um, and a lot of them have gone on to do museum work, they've published articles, they've gotten, they've written dissertations on aspects of the show. So it's been really exciting to see the way in which they've been inspired to kind of integrate theory and practice kind of through their participation. But as I said, I also blame them because this became really big and um, it could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I think um, one of the things that we discovered is how important authentic learning experiences actually are in education. And that each one of those students, and, and if you go to the back of our book, every student that, that took the class and participated in helping us to design and execute this exhibition are given credit. And, and they then, as part of this process, they, they took ownership as becoming co-collaborators and co-researchers. And 
um, I think that's what was transformative for their lives. And it was transformative for us as well because we, we discovered this teaching um, mechanism that works so well. And, and Kristen has really gone on to utilize this in most of your classes now, correct? Yes. And it always comes out extremely well. Okay, we have a few more questions. We have, um, first we have Sally, would you like to pose your question? Yes, I would, I just unmuted myself, I hope. You have. Um, good, uh, first I'm in awe to be a part of this with such renowned basket makers and to be listening to what all of you have had to say and done over the years. And it's gotten me uh, to also think about evolution of our own basketry within ourselves. And thinking about the very first basket I made, which was, I'll never forget it, um, OJ Simpson was on trial. And it was a class I took in New Haven at the Creative Arts Workshop. We met on Monday nights with a, a damp blanket on our laps and our, and our reed and we uh, discussed what had happened on the trial in the previous week. So that's how I always know. And that's where I made my first basket. And my friends all thought I was kind of crazy. But then when they saw what I was making, they started saying, well, um, can I have that one and whatever. And I've seen the evolution of myself to my very first basket. I'm wondering if any of you could, could think about the first basket you've made, you made ever, and how it compares or contrasts with what you're doing today? Oh, that's a great question. Wow. I just wrote a blog about that. Joe, how about you? Oh my goodness, my very first basket. Um, I think it was a workshop with Jane Sauer years ago, and she taught both twining and coiling in that workshop. And um, I made it out of um, coir, I believe. And, and I tried too many different things in that basket, uh, <laughs> of course. Um, and, and then and I don't think it was my second basket, but it was very early. Um, I went to Quetico to the Boundary Waters uh, to camp for a couple of weeks. And, and we were camping on an island one night and I, and I was just thinking about, okay, the Native Americans that used to live here um, found materials right here that they made baskets. And so I started clipping some branches and made this randomly woven little bowl shaped thing that I still have. <laughs> and, but now, you know, I'm doing things like this and a lot of paper incorporated and you know, it's evolved to be something quite different from those early beginnings. Thank you, Joe. But I think we can come back to this question in a minute. I might even pick on some people to, to answer that. Before we go to Kat, who has a question, uh, Barbara, are you holding a basket in your hands? Barbara Hare? Uh, I think that is her cover photo. <laughs> she might not be with us at the moment. Her basket right there with her. It's beautiful. Um, okay, uh, Kat, where are you? Do, did you have a question for us? And thank you, Sally. That was a great question. I'm going to pick on some people in a minute to answer it. Where's Kat? Oh, there you are. Okay. Hi, um, I was just wondering, and I actually wanted to get the name. I think it was a gentleman who um, was mentioned that his work was influenced by, you could see there was scaffolding through by bamboo mm -hmm. scaffolding. Don McQueen. And, um, no, I think it was, it was Mike and Doug Starn who no, did the bamboo that's scaffolding. It, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so my question was, do you know of, of anybody else who is, who is influenced by that in doing that type of work? Um, I don't. And actually, um, somewhat surprisingly, there are very few um, basketry artists in the United States working with bamboo. Mm -hmm. Carissa Brock is somebody who does it, you know, expertly. 
but most of the bamboo basketry that I'm familiar with is being done in Japan. Okay. Um, it's just really interesting that the, the scaffolding amazes me. I mean, formerly being in building as well as being a sculptor, that how, I mean, it's used as scaffolding. It's, it's incredibly strong. It's used in building, but it's also the techniques are basically basketry techniques. Mm -hmm. Right. Together. Right. So it's this whole different level of like strengths and, and a whole different function. And I think it's really interesting to kind of shrink that and, and go back and forth in that play. Yes, I think such a simple material, such simple techniques, and yet such strength. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. That's Can really you, perceptive of you, Kat, because a, a, a number of people have commented that uh, basket makers are really the architects mm -hmm. of the fiber world. Mm -hmm. right? They're the ones who know how to make things stand up. <laughs> and, and that's that's what they were doing um, back in the 60s. The they, artists were often traveling internationally and learning these techniques. Quite often they, they came from cultures that not only were doing uh, small handmade objects, but they were also building buildings and creating these architectural forms. And that's, that's what part of this um, exploration was about, and when if going back to Ed Rosbach and Ginge Lockie and um, Pat Hickman and Lillian Elliott and some of those other artists, they did not think of themselves as basket makers. They were trying to figure out how to do line drawing in space and create sculptural form, and it all comes from those architectural components that are used in baskets. Right, and I think um, that Jillian. Janine Felino talks a little bit more about the role of basketry techniques in design and in architecture. Carol, you've read her essay more recently than I have, but she really does show the degree to which, you know, that structure that's created by materials and the way in which they're put together, you know, just how similar they are. And I think it's really remarkable when you see the links between kind of art design and architecture really come together in some very simple but sophisticated ways. It, it's too bad. I, Natalie was on here earlier, but she's left and she could certainly address this. But there's going to be, uh, um a feature presentation with right. her upcoming right SAC so right. we'll have another opportunity so um I also want to ask you know I in my travels in the basket world and I ended up writing some articles about this exhibit as it traveled around the country and talked to the museum directors where the show was was um exhibiting and I always ask them what kind of response they were getting to the work. And everyone I spoke to said, first of all, that their numbers on this exhibit were out of, out of the world. They had never had an exhibit that pulled in as many people. And she said, people walk around in, walk around in amazement. And that the most common comment was something to the effect of, I had no idea all of this was going on. So um, my question, and this I will open up to, to everyone here, not just our esteemed panelists, is why is this? Why isn't for all of its dynamism and how its appeal and how people respond to it, why isn't basketry and contemporary basketry um, more out there, more acknowledged, more seen. Who wants to take that on? No one. I'm well, stuck. I'm not sure I know the answer. I can tell you my own experience with that very issue um, is why I started the blog, because uh, this was about maybe 10 or 11 years ago, and a museum curator said to me, there's not much happening in contemporary basketry anymore. And 
I was distraught because I had all these friends who are making incredible things and she didn't know. And I thought, well, how would she know? Because at that particular time, a lot of the galleries that had dealt with basketry and sort of made it more visible had been closing or changing owners. Um, it was a time when the economy was not good and a lot of museums weren't able to mount exhibitions, um, you know, invitational exhibitions. And it's why I started the blog, because I thought, what can I do to make basketry more visible? And so I Googled how to write a blog and I just sort of jumped in. <laughs> And the first time someone wrote to me and said, how do I subscribe? I said, I will look it up and get back to you. <laughs> but that's that's I, that problem solving attitude, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think, you know, it's a problem that um, it's, the National Basketry Organization is working on hard. You know, because the foundation you laid there at the at NBO and it's something that the organization is really trying to concentrate on now because we feel it is an underrecognized field in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, Barbara, would you like to make your comment to the group because it's it's very relevant. I don't know if Barbara is, uh, I will read it if she doesn't want to speak it. She said, when your exhibit opened, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I got to take a class with Joe, which led me to think outside of the box with my weaving. I've begun to weave animals and structures with willow and sticks. So thank you for my next chapter. And I really want to see those pieces, Barbara. <laughs> now, uh, Patricia, you're there, right? Hi, yep. Can you unmute yourself? I'm gonna call on Patricia because she has been watching basketry for decades and has written some of the best articles Absolutely. about contemporary basketry. Um, I encourage you to look up her writing. And she uh, wrote a chapter in the book. And she wrote a chapter in the book, she's a star. <laughs> um, Patricia, can you comment on this, on why baskets don't seem to get the traction? Or say anything else you'd like to say. Okay, well, I did think of an answer to that. And it goes back such a long time. I'm not sure it's still relevant, but um, it was probably sort of in the mid 1970s. And I went to the Brookfield, no, I guess it was the I mean, Worcester, Massachusetts, there was a big basketry show at an art center in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I went with Betty Park, who was one of the very early, early, early writers on textiles. She was not writing at the time, but um, we went to the Worcester Craft Center or where I, I may be misnaming it, because there was a one day workshop with Ed Rossbach. Ooh. I had become a great aficionado of Ed Ross, Rossbach and invited Betty to go along who didn't really, wasn't really tuned into basketry, but she was an adventurous person who liked to have new experiences. So we went to this workshop and the first part of it was Ed talking a little bit, and then he kind of stopped in mid-sentence and began to call upon other people who were there because every basket maker within driving distance of Worcester, Massachusetts was there. So I was personally a bit disappointed because I had expected to have a day with Ed Rossback, but it turned out to be a day of Ed Rossback calling attention to a lot of other people. And on the way home, Betty was talking about how moved she had been by this experience. And uh, she was an artist uh, 
who was just a very thoughtful philosophical person. And she said, well, I have never been with a group of artists with such, so non-egotistical. And I don't know whether it is the low, long-term meditative process that is involved in basket making or what, but is there something in the basket maker sensibility where the, the work itself is like the, the end, it's not promoting oneself so much that, I, I'm, I don't know, I, I don't, haven't got an articulation for this, but that was kind of what I thought about when that question came up. And I was feeling a little timid about saying it, but since you called on me, there it is. <laughs> I always like to hear what you have to say. Um, does anyone want to comment on that? Kristen, you were nodding your head vigorously. Well, I'm looking at a, a lot of these, um, a lot of the comments on here. And I, I just am nodding because with that first group of students in particular, and then with each one after that, their astonishment at what was called a basket um, was always really challenging. Um, and, you know, Joe would always ask, what is a basket? And they would, and we would struggle to figure out what that was. What do we include in that concept? Is it technique? Is it about materials? Is it about shape and form? And that's what really gave rise to the discussion. And so, and I also, you know, I, also wondered, it, it is quite gendered. One thing we struggled with in this exhibition and didn't articulate um, and didn't address directly, I think, because we were trying to get a grasp on the history was the role of women in particular in this movement, its relationship to these kind of gendered art forms, domestic art forms, those kind of links and um, to me, it just gets richer when you look at that historical part, because you see, you know, women are also in all the beauty and the ugliness of it, right? The collecting, collecting from Native Americans, selling that work. So, I, and I love the people. I mean, one of the things I enjoyed most about this show was going around and meeting all of Joe's friends. Um, <laughs> And so I think, I mean, it does seem like all these fit. And I want to add one more thing that sculpture is hard to display. And I don't know about other art programs, but we're losing all the space we have. And we've kind of lost a sculpture program here at Missouri. So I think sometimes three-dimensional objects are just harder. I mean, I don't know if it could be that simple, but to some degree, they're harder to showcase. Um, harder to display. They can't be put on a screen quite as easily. They need to be seen in the round. And, um, you know, that was one thing we kept hoping is how can we get people to see around the object? You know, we, but we didn't quite have the technological expertise to make that work, but, um, and I think all the metaphors, we also struggled all the metaphors, coming up with a title for this show was really hard because everyone wanted to reference either underwater basket weaving <laughs> or Thank whatever it was. It. <laughs> so, um, so I think as I've been reading these comments, I, I do keep laughing because I think, yes, I think that's another reason. Yes, I think that's another reason. <laughs> Well, I think I think that um, that they are good reasons, um, and I do think people have stuck in their head a very definite concept of what a basket is. I know that people come to my booth at booth shows and say, "Well, what do you put in that?" That is that's their immediate response: is it's a basket. You have to put something in it, and I have all kinds of wiseacre answers, but. But um, I want to get back to what, what Patricia said, because it's, it is a group that is very generous with what it knows. And I think that's partly because it's still an, mostly an apprenticeship craft. 
you, you, most people learn basketry from other basket makers, which gets us to another question we've had, which is how do you learn more about making baskets? And uh, Pam Morton is on here and she is the executive director of the National Basketry Organization. And Pam, are you available to answer that? There she is. Oh, yes, I unhid myself. Um, could you repeat the question again, though? <laughs> well, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you are an excellent source. Where should people go if they want to learn more about making baskets? Um, I would say, and I'm going to toss this back and forth between Carol and myself because she's our board president. Certainly on our website, we have lists of teachers and classes. And if that's not good, you can email me. Um, and I will put my email in the chat when I'm not doing this because I don't seem to multitask well these days. Um, and also Joan, who's on the call, also works for NBO. And she has information, but really just going to nationalbasketry.org will get you a wealth of information. There's tabs, you can sign up for our over under newsletter and we list classes and other things. Oh, thank you, Molly. I saw that in the chat. Um, so I think, you know, we try to offer as much as possible as far as linking people together. We also have a teacher Zoom where teachers gather every month and, you know, we track them so we can hook people up with them and they're from all over the country and actually out of the country too. So we do try and provide as many resources as possible to people who want to learn more about basketry. And you're having a digital conference Ju July 29th through the 31st, correct? Absolutely. It's an online gathering. It's called Virtually Woven. It's over a little over two days. Thursday night is a free event. And you can also find that on our website. It's right on the homepage. And that sort of will be a preview of what we'll be doing, including an opening of our first online event. Some of you are in it, like Joe <laughs> and, um, and Lois and Carol and Joan, and I can't track everybody. Oh, and Polly, right? Yes, Polly too. Um, so yeah, so that, and I think Lynn, well, Lynn is a participant, she's a panelist. Um, so there's a lot we have going on there and it's Friday and Saturday. There's a couple of programs each day with panelists and it, we're hoping it's really fascinating. I have been fortunate to meet and, you know, work with everybody who's going to be in it. So I, we're excited about it. Thank it looks you. really exciting. Um, I would also say you, you can also keep track. All of the craft schools mm -hmm. do offer uh, workshops with very accomplished basket makers. And you shouldn't be afraid of that if you're a relative beginner, because I think we all like working with beginners. And if you have a look around for a local basketry guild, they often are have wonderful um, workshops available through guilds. And uh, that's where a lot of people get started. So um, I recommend that as well. Uh, this has been wonderful. We are reaching the end of our time. Um, I just love seeing all these faces on here. And having this discussion, it is, I am a confirmed uh, Canistra maniac and hope that you will join me in that um, diagnosis. Uh, I also wanna thank Brigida and Molly and all of the crew at SAC who've done such a good job getting this going. We have opened our online store uh, which features not just baskets, but every kind of fiber um, object you can consider. It's an exhibition and sale. So um, I plan on being there this evening. You might want to get there before I do. Uh, and um, I also want to thank 
everybody who supports SAC because we really uh, like being able to provide programming like this and bringing together people who care about the things that we care about. And we very, very much want to keep all of these things free so that they are accessible. And I would be remiss if I did not invite you to join us in supporting our efforts. Um, there is no contribution too small or too large. And um, I know that uh, Brigida is going to post a couple of links, uh, which would make it very easy. And you can also find us um, a, a donate button on our website. Uh, we make it very prominent. But I do thank you all for coming for your contributions in the comments. And to those of you I, I um, targeted and made you talk when maybe you hadn't wanted to. And especially to Joe and Kristen and Carol, I personally could listen to the three of you um, <laughs> for hours and hours and hours. So with that, um, I will say good night and wish you all a very pleasant weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.